I've been making you a nice little nuclear video here. Just a nice introduction to nuclear chemistry. Nothing too complicated here. Starting here with your vocab. I would suggest pausing this, writing these uh, definitions down. I will use these words throughout this uh, video, so you'll need to know them. Uh, starting here with your types of radiation, we are just going to cover three types. Um, you've got the alpha decay, where it basically spits out a helium nucleus. Um, and you take a large uh, atom and break it down into something that's still pretty big, but not as big. Um, basically what happens is it causes the mass number to go down by four because an alpha particle, a helium nucleus, it's written like this. This is the mass number. This is the atomic number. And if you remember from a long time ago, mass number is equal to the number of protons and neutrons, whereas the atomic number is just the number of protons. Uh, so that's the change that it causes for the mass numbers there. It is the biggest form of decay, which isn't saying much because it's still really tiny. It's a helium nucleus, and it is the least energetic. And then you have a beta decay, and the beta decay is really interesting. It's the emission of an electron, and you're probably thinking, wait a minute. How on earth does an electron come from a nucleus? Well, I have a nice little video that I am going to show you. And i got to look it up because I don't have it preloaded. Whoopsie daisy. I pushed the wrong button. Come on. Beta decay right here. So watch this cute little movie. Here we have a carbon. This is a carbon-14 atom that is undergoing its beta decay. And you can see that the beam of beta particles is curving towards the positive end of these electrodes, which tells you opposites attract, a beta is negative. It means it's an electron. But if you fast forward it to this point right here, where you can see the actual nucleus, they start to point out a particular particle in the nucleus. You know in a nucleus you only have protons and neutrons. Well in this particular case a blue particle is a neutron. And what happens is this neutron splits apart into a proton and an electron. And if you look up what a nucleus is, or I'm sorry, what a neutron is, a neutron is a beta, or a um, proton and an electron put together. And so during a beta decay, that neutron breaks apart into a proton and an electron, and electrons don't belong in a nucleus. And so it gets spit out of the nucleus and emitted as a beta particle. So that's where the electron can come from. So coming, we don't need to look it up in a dictionary. Coming back to our notes here, that's what a beta decay is. The mass number does stay the same, though, because the overall number of particles in the nucleus, it hasn't changed. But the atomic number increases by one because you had a neutron turn into a proton. So we have one less neutron, one more proton. So atomic number goes up by one, mass number stays the same. It's tiny, it's just an electron that gets spit out, and it is the medium energy of the three types of radiation that we're going to talk about. The third and final kind of radiation is this gamma decay stuff. And a gamma decay does not result in um, a change in mass in any way. All it is is a release of pure energy, a high energy, and in fact the highest energy, electromagnetic waves. It is almost always associated with some other form of decay, whether a beta decay or an alpha decay or some of the other decays that we're not talking about. It doesn't have any size. There's no mass to a gamma, de uh, gamma decay, a gamma radiation. Um, but it is the highest energy because it is pure energy. This is just a nice little graph about half-lives showing you that after a half-life one half of the material has decayed. A big misconception is that a half-life is half of the amount of time it takes for something to decay, but that's not a half-life. A half-life is the amount of time it takes for half of a sample to decay. So if you started out with 100 grams of a sample, after one half-life, you would have 50 grams left. And the more stable the nuclei, the longer the half-life, which just kind of makes sense. 
So here's a little bit of half-life practice. I like to do what I call the arrow method whenever you are working out a half-life calculation. So that's what I'm going to show you here. Yes, there is a mathematical way of doing it. I'm sure you can find tons of videos about the mathematical way to figure out a half-life. Um, but I just prefer the arrow way. So in this particular case, the half-life of polonium-210 is 138.4 days. How many milligrams of polonium-210 remain after 415.2 days if you start with 2 milligrams? So we are starting with 2 milligrams. After 138.4 days, one half-life, we're going to have 1 milligram left over, a half-life. Half of the sample has decayed after the specified amount of time. So after another 138.4 days, for a grand total of 276.8 days, we've had yet another half decay, so now we're down to 0.5 milligrams. Every time it just goes down by one half. So we still haven't got to 415.2 days. So after another 138.4 days, so now 276.8 plus 138.4, oh, look at that, is exactly 415.2 days, gives us a leftover amount of 0.25 milligrams. So after 415.2 days, you will have started with 2 milligrams and decayed it through three half-lives to a total remaining amount of 0.25 milligrams. So now going on to this one as an example. Sample contains, starts with, 16 milligrams of a different form of polonium. After 12 minutes, the sample contains one milligram. Now they want to know what's the half-life. Well, we have to figure out how many half-lives did we go to, to go through to get from 16 to one. So if we start at 16, after one half-life, we'll have eight milligrams left over. After a second half-life, we have four milligrams left over. After a third, we're down to two. And after a fourth, we're down to one. So it took us four half-lives to get from 16 down to one. Well, that four half-lives, I'm just gonna call it an HL for half-life, so four half-lives was equal to, the question told us, 12 minutes. So one half-life must be how many minutes? We'll just take four divided by 12 and you get three. Now the other type of question you would have to answer about a nuclear chemistry is just balancing these reactions. And again, there's a big complicated way to do it, or there's the super easy way, separate this into two addition problems. Remember the top number here is the mass number, the bottom number here is the atomic number. And according to the law of conservation of mass, whatever mass you start with has to be equal to the mass that you end with. And so this is what I mean when I say separate it into two separate addition problems. Take the top numbers, turn them into an addition uh, problem. Take the bottom numbers, turn it into a second addition problem. So using this first one as an example, we're gonna replace the arrow with an equal. And we're gonna say 43 equals 43 plus blank. Oh, uh, by the way, what we're trying to do is fill in the blank. What's the missing particle here? So 43 equals 43 plus blank. Well, obviously it has to be 43 plus zero. So the mass number of our missing <coughs> species is zero. So now moving on to the bottom, we have 19 equals 20 plus blank. Well, 20 plus what equals 19? 20 plus negative one. So that means the atomic number of this guy must be negative one, and the only particle that corresponds to a zero mass number, a negative one atomic number, is our beta particle, so that's the missing species. Doing the same thing with this down here. Again, replacing the arrow with an equals to turn it into an addition problem. So we have 233 equals blank plus four. Well, to figure out what's in the blank, subtract four from both sides and we get 229. So whatever our particle is, has a mass number of 229. So to figure out the atomic number, we're gonna take 92 equals blank plus two. Well, the blank has to be 90. 
Well, none of our radioactive particles have an atomic number of 90. Well, that means we have to go to the periodic table. So what element on the periodic table has an atomic number of 90? And if you look at the periodic table, you see that thorium has an atomic number of 90. So now moving on to this last one. We have blank equals 14 plus 0. Well, 14 plus 0 is 14. So whatever our particle is has a mass number 14. For the final one, we have blank equals 7 plus negative 1. Well, 7 plus negative 1 is 6. Again, we do not have a nuclear radiation and nuclear decay that has an atomic number of 6, so we go to the periodic table. And the element with an atomic number of 6 is carbon. This is um, just explaining the reason that a nucleus is unstable is because there is an imbalance between its protons and neutrons. And every element has a slightly different balance, but a ratio, an ideal ratio of protons and neutrons that it needs. If that ratio is not met, then the nucleus is unstable and it needs to go through at least one decay to become stable. But some elements, such as this uranium-238 right here, it needs lots of decays. And so each one of these arrows indicates a separate decay. So like this first decay right here, we went from uranium-238 to thorium-234. And so the, atom or the mass number went down by 4, and uranium has an atomic number of 92, thorium is 90. So that means the atomic number went down by uh, 2, and anytime you have a mass number decrease of 4, atomic number decrease of 2, that means you had an alpha particle be released. And then these guys right here, we went from thorium-234 to protactinum, also 234, but now we're at 91. And when you do not change the mass number, but the atomic number goes up by 1, well, that was a beta particle. And so you can see this series of decays ultimately lands uranium at a stable isotope of lead. And then this is just some vocabulary here that you can read over. These are your three different types of um, penetrating ability of the different types of radiation. Alpha radiation, which is the helium nucleus that's released during an alpha decay, it's not very penetrating. A piece of paper will stop alpha decay. This is the electron that's released during a beta decay. It'll make it through a piece of paper, but gets stopped by a piece of wood. And then the gamma decay, the pure energy, <coughs> paper and wood don't stop it. A big old thick slab of cement will stop it. A hunk of lead will stop it. And then this is just um, talking about the damage done and the units that go with that. So you guys might want to know a little bit about that. I know I'm not giving you a lot of details, but again, you don't need a lot of details at this level. Uh, talking about the two different kinds of uh, nuclear reactions, fission and fusion. Fission is where it splits apart. A large heavy nucleus splits apart into two smaller nuclei, releasing some neutrons on the way that can go off and cause other fission reaction, resulting in a chain reaction. And this would be a fusion reaction where you have two tiny nuclei, in these cases two different isotopes of hydrogen, coming together to form a helium nucleus, releases a whole heck of a lot of energy. Um, and this is what nuclear reactors use, the fission reaction. Fusion is what's in the hydrogen bomb and it's what happens in stars. Uh, these are three types of nuclear radiation detection, y'all can read about that. This is what I, oh, hey, I need to hurry up before my battery dies. Uh, this is uh, applications of nuclear radiation. I'm not going to talk a whole lot about that because I don't want my battery to die and me to lose all this. But this is a bone scan using technidium-99. Then technidium-99 actually attaches to rapidly growing cells, uncontrollably growing cells, also known as cancer cells. So this particular image is of a gentleman that had started with spinal cancer and has since metastasized 
into other bones throughout his body. Anywhere where it's not this like nice shade of blue is where he's got some cancer going on. And this is just a scan of kidneys, the transport of a radioactive dye through kidneys to show kidney function. So kind of cool stuff. And that is all that I have to say about that. Um, if you have any questions, you know how to get in contact with me. Have a great day.